Ghost. Amen. O Lord, the altar of God. Even as to God, my joy and You sent with me, O God, and defend my cause against the ungodly people to deliver me from the deceitful and wicked men. For thou art God, my strength, why hast thou looked me on thee? And why will I so heavily all the enemy oppressed thee? O send out thy light and thy truth, that they may lead me, and bring me to thy holy hill and to thy dwelling. And that I may come unto the altar of God. Even unto God with my joy and gladness, and upon the heart will I give thanks unto thee, O God, my God. Why art thou so heavy, O my soul, and why art thou so despised within me? O oh, will that I trust in God, for I will yet give him thanks, which is the help of my countenance and my heart. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, it is now, and ever shall be, for all will die unto Amen. I will go unto the altar of God. Even unto God with my joy and gladness. Our help is in the hand of the Lord. I confess, Almighty God, the Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, the Blessed Michael, the Archangel, the Blessed John Baptist, the Holy Apostles, Peter and Paul, all the saints, and they, my brethren, that I have sinned exceedingly in thought, word, and deed, by my fault, by my own fault, by my own most grievous fault. Wherefore, I beg, Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, Blessed Michael, the Archangel, Blessed John Baptist, the Holy Apostles, Peter and Paul, all the angels and saints, and they, my brethren, Pray for the Lord our God. Amen. I confess, Almighty God, to bless the Mary the Virgin, to bless Michael the Archangel, to bless the John the Baptist, to the Holy Apostles of Peter and Paul, to all the saints and to thee, Father, that I have seen exceedingly in God, the Word of Thee, by my fault, by my own fault, by my own most grievous fault.
Lord, we beseech thee, the Spirit, to think and do always such things as be right, that we who cannot do anything that is good without thee may by thee be enabled to live according to thy will, through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. Daughter and daughter against mother. 
mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. The gospel of the Lord. is not seeking the welfare of this people, but their harm. May the words of my mouth, the meditation of all of our hearts, be acceptable in my sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Those words from the first reading today are an accusation. This man is not seeking the welfare of this people, but their arm. It is an accusation made against the prophet of God, Jeremiah. It is an accusation that is leveled because what he is doing is proclaiming God's truth, and the people do not want to hear it. The context of the situation is that the enemies of God, it's God's people have surrounded the city, and it looks like as if all hope is lost. All hope is lost, because the reason that they are surrounded and their enemies are upon them is because of their sin. It is because they have not held faith with God, and they are about to receive his chastisements for it. And Jeremiah is trying to proclaim to them that you are not going to defend the city. God has given it into their hands because of what you have done. Now, there were people there who wanted to fight and not surrender. God has told Jeremiah that if your people surrender, they will live. They'll be taken into captivity. They will be chastised, but they will live. But if they defend the city, they're going to be killed, every one of them and the city is going to be burned. God's truth, the word of the Lord, thanks be to God. The people don't want to hear it. The accusation is, he said something, but he's not seeking the welfare of the people, but their harm. I actually had in my notes when I started writing this that that was a disdain for the truth of God. It's not a disdain for the truth of God. It's a tremendously disordered approach to God's truth. I will listen to what God has to say if it conforms with what I want. As long as, you know, I'm in the comfort zone, then God's word is fine. But if you say something to be like, I'm going to be taken to a captive, no, I don't want any part of that. God's truth is God's truth. And it is not a discussion about what happened as a history lesson in Jeremiah's day. It is how we as individuals, it is how our church must approach God's truth. How our approach to his truth must be ordered. It is a disorder to mess around with God's truth so that people are okay with it. Again, if that doesn't drive the point home for us in our day, nothing else does. Because that's what we have been surrounded with for years now, is trying to ignore the truths of the faith. Don't present this. Don't present that. We used to do this. We used to believe that. But not, uh, Catholicism doesn't work like that. It serves God, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That means his truth is invariable. Okay, we can build upon the truth, but we never change the truth. But unfortunately, such are the times in which we live. Got bishops running around questioning the existence of hell. And well, if there might be a hell, we don't know if there's anybody there. 
Boldface lie. How about lie? Jesus Christ talks about hell all the time. It's a real place. There is real suffering that goes on there for all eternity. You don't want to go there. Why would somebody deny that then? This accusation. If the people hear that, you're not seeking their welfare. You'll do harm to the people by proclaiming that kind of truth. You give them the warm and fuzzies when they come to church. That means they'll keep coming and they'll keep giving. It's an ancillary consideration, maybe, of their eternal soul. Our eternal souls are bound with how we keep and present the truths of Almighty God. It must be ordered correctly that we approach that truth as it is, the truth of God. And we cannot fudge on it, not even a little bit. Because if we do, souls are in danger. This is why this is so important. This isn't a history lesson. This is something that we have to live because the truth of God is hard. To proclaim the truth of God is hard. To live a practical Catholic life is hard. Or it should be. If it's not, there's problems. Our Lord Jesus Christ in the Gospel today, He says, I came to cast fire upon the earth. I was actually somewhat surprised that that Gospel's even read today. I mean, there's a whole lot of left out that you know, things of, are of that nature. Fire, hell, judgment, the exclusivity of Jesus Christ, our association with the world. We don't want to talk about that because uh, that will harm the people. No, it's God's truth. And they're like, Rose Reed, like, hmm, I wonder how that slipped in. It slipped in because of this, because you know, it's, I'm, I, I'm, I'm studying for this homily, and I'm, I'm reading, you know, I always, I go across the board. I just don't read these conservative people. For, I, you know, I read everything. Okay, what's this guy got to say? What's this guy doing? And then it struck me. Oh, okay, that's why it's there, because there's an emphasis in a whole lot of commentaries. I came to cast fire on the earth. That's the burning fire of his love for us. That sounds nice. Sounds all well and good. And he does have a burning fire of love for us and that sacred heart of his. But how it was ultimately manifest was the trials that he endured in this world that led up to his agonizing crucifixion that we may get into heaven. This is what we have to understand of God's truth here. When our Lord Jesus Christ said, I came to cast fire upon the earth, if he was talking about his burning love for everybody, would he go immediately into this division that's going to be caused by this burning fire that he is casting upon the earth? That's out of context. That wouldn't happen. So he can't be talking about that. When he talks about coming to cast fire, although the, the scriptures use fire as an illustration for a lot of different things in scripture. His word, the gospel itself, the Holy Spirit first and foremost. How did the Holy Spirit manifest himself? As tongues of fire. Okay? This fire that illumines. Yeah, absolutely. All that good stuff. And the burning love that he has for us. But it's all integral. All of it. And the integrity of those things are what make you different from them, which is going to foster the division. And when I say them, I don't just mean people outside of the church. Them is people who do not adhere or have a disordered view of God's truth. I will accept it like a salad bar. I like this, I like that, I don't like that. I'll take thirds of that over there, but I don't want any of that over there. That's not how God's truth works. It's his truth. You got to take it. Got to eat your veggies. Okay, this is God's truth. He came to cast fire on the world. It, in Jeremiah's prophecy... As you read on, the Holy Spirit speaking to the prophet says, Is not my word like fire? Oh, that means it's love. Like a hammer which breaks the rocks in pieces. That's what we're talking about here. He's talking about divisions. He's talking about persecutions. He's talking about this infinite list of nastiness that can happen to us 
When we embrace the truths of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm not talking about, I was baptized and I go to Mass on Sunday. I'm talking about if you live as a Catholic, which you must. You must be that light on a lampstand, that salt of the earth. Our Lord Jesus Christ is talking about divisions and persecutions and all other kind of badness that will, it, not will, is going to happen. Because he says from his own lips, they will hate you because they hated me first. This starts in our interior life. This whole idea with this fire thing and the discomfort. When we first come to the realization, and like I said, I'm not talking about when you're baptized, baptized as an infant and all the times you went to Mass. I'm talking about when you come to the conclusion at some point in your life, when you are of an age of accountability, and go, God's really serious about this stuff. He is. He's deadly serious about what he has said. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. It cannot help to be divisive when you embrace the truth claims of our Lord Jesus Christ. It starts, as I said, in our interior lives. As you get closer to Jesus Christ, guess what happens? This whole, the fire thing, it talks about the fire consuming stubble, refining gold. It is not a pleasant experience. When we come to Christ and we realize, no, he is deadly serious about this stuff. i got to fix some things. That fire burns up stubble with it, and it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable. It, it's not just uncomfortable. It is horribly painful. Yeah? Oh, you're a priest. You say something. I was out of the church for 25 years. 25 years. I know what it's like out there. I know their perceptions. And guess what? It wouldn't take a strong wind to blow me back there. The temptations are always there. Because guess what? You're lying to yourself. You look back on your past and say, oh, I hated that. I hate when I... Liar. We love that stuff. We love that stuff. It was fun. Heck, you can't help you get into this. Uh, I'm going to tell stories about it. You know you shouldn't, but all of a sudden, well, I won't tell that story, but I'll allude to something. And then all of a sudden, you're telling stories. Because what you love, that stuff, it was great. Something so mundane as how you talk. You know, God doesn't care what you say. He doesn't care if you use curse words and stuff like that. It's not what the Scriptures say. There are several places we talk about evil communications coming out of your mouth. Don't use foul talk. Because it's a bad witness. Okay? We have to appreciate that stuff. God does care about the most mundane aspects of our life. He does care. He is deadly serious about caring. You know? You got to think back. <laughs> I'm using my own self as an example today. It's easy. Yeah. Oh, man, I used to crack people up when I talked like that. When I said this, when I did that. Man, these jokes, that was a great joke. I wish I had said you want to do that because you like, you like making people happy. That's the disordered thing. You know, it's just the opposite of the accusation of Jeremiah. This man's seeking the welfare of the people. He likes when they like him. It's not doing them any harm. Yes, it is. This is what I mean about our interior lives. It starts in here. It starts to become uncomfortable. You've got to shake that stuff. And it doesn't go away. It will not go away. You just have to deal with it. You have to deal with the former temptations and everything, and you have to forego them and keep them stiff-armed. It's a struggle. That's the fire part of it. It will happen in our families. It will happen among our friends. Our Lord Jesus Christ is explicit about this idea of it's going to be divisive in families. There is not a week that goes by, not a week, that I don't hear several, not once, not a week goes by when I don't hear several incidents of stuff in families, lesser or greater extent, about the faith. Do you start winding up people coming here? All right? Oh, you became fanatics. Yeah. Rigid. I guess rigid. I would like when people use that as a pejorative. You're rigid. Thank you. That should be the response. Because truth is invariable. 
You shouldn't be bending. You should be rigid about the truth of God because your eternal destiny is incumbent upon it. And when you are rigid about things, people who are not are going to be bent about it. They are not going to like it. They hated him first. They're going to hate you. It is going to manifest itself amongst the people of God. Look at the city of Jeremiah. You know, there were some people that wanted to hear what's going on. What does God say about this? But the vast majority of them, don't talk to me about that stuff. That couldn't be true because why? I don't like it. This is why we live in a day when we don't talk about sin. We don't talk about hell. You know, I'll listen to all your hardcore stuff and everything. You start talking about this sin. You're talking about my daughter. And I will not have it. I'm out of here. God's truth. God's truth. That's all there is to it. That's why we hear about sin. And we hear about hell around here. Pretty regularly. This is going to cause division. He has not come bring, to bring priests. I always the whole dialogue thing our Lord Jesus Christ never dialogued with anybody repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand that was the message never a dialogue never hey let's discuss this let's kind of work something out here no this is the truth we're going to crucify him still the truth you're crucified oh well God's truth when people talk about peace in our day is a shallow harmony that results from ignoring truth. Can you live a life, a milk toast life, a life of ambiguity and relativism, and everybody's just going to like the heck out of you? Yep, you can certainly do that. Look around you. The vast majority of your friends, I mean, even in the church, they're living their life like that. I don't talk about that around other people because that offends them. Well, it's God's truth. And we don't look to offend anybody, but we can't help it if we're living God's truth. We are not called to live some shallow harmony that results from ignoring truth. We're supposed to live in genuine peace. And you know what happens? Genuine peace has divisions as a byproduct. People don't like it. Not everyone wants to hear the truth, just like in Jeremiah's day, especially in ours. This is where it gets practical for us to understand this. Your interior life, your life with your family and friends, other people who you know in the church, they're going to criticize where you are now because you adhere to God's truth more and more. It's practical and it's painful. St. Ambrose says a couple things in an exposition on this particular passage of uh, the Gospel of Luke. He's talking about the divisions, and notice those are family divisions. You know? well, I don't get along with pe you know, other people out there. Well, of course, pagans aren't going to like me talking about your family. St. Ambrose says that parents are not to be loved more than God. Children are not supposed to be loved more than God. They cannot be loved more than God. How can you love the gift more than the one who gave it? God is more important. If Jesus, in not calling on you to hate your parents like emotionally, whoever does not hate father or mother, son or daughter, is not worthy of me. Again, he's not calling you to hate your parents. He's saying that you should love me so much more than them that your love for them looks like hate. Parents cannot be loved more than God. Family relationships, friend relationships, those are bonds of nature. And St. Ambrose says, and I quote, bonds of nature do not bind faith. I'd actually take it far. It's not a matter that they do not bind faith. They cannot bind faith. You got a family member or a close friend who goes into a lifestyle, for instance, that's repugnant to God, that's monstrous, you know, horrendously sinful. Well, that's just the way they're living their life. You don't care one lick about them. You hate them. You hate them if you don't say anything because their soul's in jeopardy. You're just letting it go. They might hate you for telling them, but guess what? Years from now, what you say might change them. 
That's how the Holy Spirit works. That we are not relativists. We have to understand this. This is an imperative to confront people with it because that's living practical Catholicism. You know, you do not, you, when something like that happens, and in our day and age, it's not a matter of generally if it happens, it's going to be a matter of when it happens. Somebody leaving the church, somebody getting involved in a lifestyle or in a sin issue that is horrendous. We cannot, well, I have to reevaluate my faith now. No, absolutely not. You have to reevaluate your relationship with that person or those people. My family doesn't like that I do. My family doesn't like that I'm this rigid anymore. You don't reevaluate your faith. You reevaluate your relationship with your family. I don't want to talk about cutting them off and ignoring them forever. It generally doesn't have to happen like that. But if that may be necessary, if you don't change, if you don't stop going there, if you don't stop reading your scriptures and telling me about catechism, I don't want you around here anymore. Don't go around there anymore. Bonds of nature cannot bind your faith. We are constrained. Our Lord Jesus Christ in that gospel said today, I have a baptism to be baptized with. What is he talking about? His crucifixion. And he says, how I am constrained until it is accomplished. Like our Lord Jesus Christ did not walk around with this dumb grin on his face. Well, I'm going to hang on the cross for everybody because how much I love him. He sweat drops of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane. Father, if there is any way. He knew what he had to do, but it was still overwhelming to him. But he was constrained to do it, and he did it. We are constrained by the same faith, and we are constrained by the same obedience. It is not a suggestion. It is an imperative. We must do it. It's the same thing that our Lord Jesus Christ, we are, we, we have a baptism, which we are going to be baptized. And it happens all the time throughout our lives. Every day comes a new opportunity to be baptized. And what is our baptism, as St. Paul said? Through our baptism, we are buried with Christ in his death. And we're raised in newness of life. We are constrained. Our Lord Jesus Christ was. Why do we expect anything different? In the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. I believe in one God, the Father of all might, maker of heaven and earth. Father James, 
that they may both by their life and doctrine set forth thy true and lively word, and rightly and duly administer thy holy sacraments. And to all thy people give thy heavenly grace, and especially to this congregation here present, that we part and do reverence, they may hear and receive thy holy word, truly serving thee in holiness and righteousness all the days of their life. We beseech thee also so to rule the hearts of those who bear the authority of government in this and every land, that they may be led to wise decisions and right actions for the welfare and peace of the world. Open, O Lord, the eyes of all people to behold thy gracious hand in all thy works, the rejoicing and thy whole creation. They may honor thee with their substance to be faithful stewards of thy bounty. And we most humbly beseech thee of thy goodness, O Lord, to comfort and succor all those who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. Thinking this day especially of the Gray family. And we also bless thy holy name for all thy servants departed this life in thy faith and fear. Especially David, deacon, who seek thee to be merciful, and grant the fullness of joy in thy love and service, and to grant us grace and to follow the good example of the Blessed Virgin Mary, of Saint Agibus, and of all thy saints, that with them we may be partakers of thy heavenly kingdom. Grant these our prayers, O Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our mediator and advocate, and we thee and the Holy Ghost be our honor and glory.
Pray, brethren, that this, my sacrifice and yours, may be acceptable unto God the Father Almighty. May the Lord accept the sacrifice of thy hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and the of all the soul of the church. Accept, O Lord, we pray thee, the gifts which of thine own bounty we do offer unto thee, that by the powerful operation of thy grace, these holy mysteries may sanctify our conduct in this life present, and bring us to the end to everlasting felicity through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you.
Thou faithful God, we beseech thee in all things to make this oblation blessed, approved and accepted, a perfect and worthy offering, that it may become for us the body and blood of thy dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Who the day before he suffered took bread into his holy and venerable hands. And with eyes lifted up to heaven unto thee, God, his Almighty Father, giving thanks to thee, he blessed, broke, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you.
Oremus. Praeceti sali terras moniti, e divina institutione formati, audehimus dicere. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us.
behold the Lamb of God. Behold him that taketh away the sin of the world. These are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldst come under my roof, but the seed of the world in my soul shall be healed. Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldst come under my roof, but the seed of the world in my soul shall be healed. Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldst come under my roof, but the seed of the world in my soul shall be healed.
heavenly mysteries may renew us both in body and soul, that we who have therein offered unto thee our outward worship may inwardly perceive the effectual benefit of the same, through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. The peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. The Mass is ended. Depart in peace. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. We begin with the Holy Gospel according to St. John the Divine. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And it was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shined in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God, his name was John. The same came for witness, to bear witness of the light that all men through Him might believe. He was not that light, but said to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which lighted every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, the world was made by him, the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not, but as many as received him. To them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. He beheld his glory, the glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Amen. Amen. 